morning, everyone. I'd like, oops, sorry, I'd like to call this meeting to order at 10.03 a.m. Uh, please note that in-person attendance in council chamber is restricted due to COVID-19. Though held electronic, electronically using a video conference platform, this meeting is open to the public and all representation to the committee will form part of the public record. The meeting will be live streamed on YouTube and will be available for viewing anytime through the duncan.civicweb.net backslash portal backslash or go to youtube.com and search City of Duncan. If you're unable to view the meeting at home, please contact the Corporate Services Coordinator at Allison, A-L-L-I-S-O-N, at duncan.ca to arrange viewing at City Hall. Questions regarding items on the agenda may be sent in advance of the meeting to the Corporate Services Coordinator at Allison at duncan.ca. Please make sure to include both your name and address for identification purposes. Moving on to item two, introduction of late items. Ms. Boyd, are there any late items? There are no late items, Chair. Perfect, thank you. Moving on to number three, adoption of the agenda. I will read the motion that is that the February 24th, 2022 advisory design panel agenda be adopted as circulated. Do we have a mover and seconder? Graham, thank you. Angela, are you able to second that? Thank you, motion carried. Are there any questions? Sorry, before motion's carried. No, okay, so, so carried. Adoption of the minutes um, of the January 27th meeting. So the motion is that the minutes of the January 27th, 2022 advisory design panel meeting be adopted as presented. Do we have a mover and seconder? Graham? Angela, thank you. Are there any errors or omissions? Seeing none, motions carried. Then moving on to number five, new business, the official community plan update. The motion on the table will be that the advisory design panel receive the official community plan update for information only, and that the advisory design panel provide comments on the draft development permit areas. So can we get a mover and seconder on that? Graham and Angela, thank you. Um, so carried, so Mr. Blakely, can you introduce the speaker today? Yes, um, so uh, today uh, I believe it'll be Owen um, from Urban Systems who will be presenting a brief update on uh, the official community plan um, and also on the proposed draft development permit areas update. Um, so since we're probably gonna be tight on time, I'll just turn it right over to Owen and he can uh, jump into the presentation. Thank you all, I'll share my screen here and get started. Is everyone able to see that screen? Yes, we can. Yes. Yeah. Good. Okay, if at any point uh, my audio is cutting out or if we're having trouble, technical issues, let me know, raise your hand and I, I'd be happy to, uh, to, to try and address it as best I can. Um, thank you all for having me today and the, having the opportunity to present this information to you. As Matt said, we're going to be providing a, a brief overview of the official community plan update and then um, looking to have a bit more of a fulsome discussion around um, the draft development permit areas. Um, and as I previously mentioned before we went live, that really this is an opportunity for discussion and um, to lean on the panel and to um, utilize your experience with, with the guidelines in Duncan um, to kind of highlight some areas of, of key considerations or issues or otherwise that you might have noticed in the development permit areas and relate that back to the experience that you have um, on the ground. Um, so we'll get started here. So we'll, we'll just briefly go through, as I said, an overview of the official community plan process to date. Um, we will touch on the draft division and land use designations. Um, and then item four will help probably be our opportunity for, um, for discussion around the draft development permit areas. And then we'll wrap up the session with um, some discussion of next steps and uh, the ongoing community engagement opportunities um, happening in late February and early March. Um, 
Well, it turns out Kyle isn't here today, but we have uh, Matt and Spencer uh, from the city of Duncan with us. Um, and uh, I didn't properly introduce myself. My name is Owen Seaford. Um, I've been working with the official community plan team, uh, along with the transportation and mobility strategy team. That's um, also a, a concurrent project to, to the official community plan update. Just a brief note on that. Um, obviously, these two plans are going on simultaneously. Um, as I just mentioned, that there are some community engagement going on for both for both plans. Um, and obviously, there will be some overlap between the two. Maybe not on the DPA side, um, but we are trying to kind of synergize these these processes as we go along. Um, so that's just a brief note on that. Sorry. So jumping into our, our overview of the official community plan process. What are the goals of the project? So there's four primary goals. The first is to improve the clarity of the plan um, and creating a more user-friendly document that more accurately reflects the current direction uh, of the city in the official community plan. Um, part of this is to consolidate policies, including uh, OCP amendments, regional planning initiatives, and, and neighborhood plans that have um, been undertaken since the, the previous OCP was adopted. Um, this is all part of addressing some of the key issues that are identified in the OCP um, and making sure that the, the plan is, um, is usable um, for as, as a, a document that, that regulates land use in the city. And then finally, we, we want to update the regulations to ensure that they are also uh, reflecting uh, current conditions in the city. The role of OCP in, in development. Um, for one, it, it, it is a key document that aligns existing plans, policies, bylaws, and guidelines. Um, and it is one of the many tools that shapes development in the city of Duncan. Uh, as I previously mentioned, uh, the OCP update will aim to integrate planning that has taken place since the, the adoption of the last document. Um, and to also, once upon adoption, to make sure that the land use directions provided in the OCP are also reflected in other key policies and bylaws, such as the zoning bylaw, development cost charges, um, and otherwise. Um, in terms of the role that the, the OCP, OCP plays in land development, it offers a framework to guide development and land use decision making um, that hopefully reflects the community's vision for future growth and development and encourages rezoning and development applications that align with the intent of the official community plan. Um, as you are, are well aware, the development permit area guidelines uh, are the um, are area specific development guidelines um, that can dictate things such as form and character, uh, the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions also uh, relate to hazard lands, uh, flooding, steep slopes and otherwise. Um, and they provide a little bit of flexibility and also uniform enforcement when it comes to, to design. Here's a quick overview of the process and where we're at right now. Um, we kicked off almost a year ago in March 2021. And having moved through the background review and some community information gathering in phases one and two, uh, we're now firmly in, in phase three, which we're calling plan development. Um, and that's kind of where we, we are producing these, the draft OCP, development preliminary guidelines, land use designations, and otherwise. Um, and then hopefully, um, upon the conclusion of this next phase of community engagement and collecting um, feedback from the committees, such as the advisory committee, the advisory design panel, um, stakeholders, uh, then we will be moving into the final phase, phase four um, of OCP adoption, which could be extending into to June of 2022 now. The OCP combines a whole uh, variety of factors varying from the physical, including land use itself, lot size, services, amenities, parks, and transportation, and that being a key link to the transportation mobility strategy, um, with market forces, uh, how uh, the population of Duncan is growing, um, what existing housing supply looks like, um, and how um, some, of this, some of these market trends are being timed. Um, while also ensuring that key planning principles such as housing diversity, smart density, urban design, the provision of community amenities and comprehensive public engagement are adhered to. And finally, that this is a, a regulatory document that will ultimately influence um, many different factors, many different facets of, of development and growth in Duncan as well. So moving into some of the um, draft content that is being developed as part of the OCP. We will briefly touch on the community vision and then have a little bit more of a deeper dive on, on the land use designations. Uh, 
the draft community vision, um, you can see on the screen here now, um, the current vision is rather succinct and it's to be one of the most livable small towns in Canada. Um, to update this and to try and elaborate a little bit, the revised vision is um, as follows, as Duncan is one of the most livable small towns in Canada, proudly serving as the economic and cultural heart of the Cowichan Valley. Located in the traditional territory of the Cowichan Nation, Duncan is welcoming, diverse, creative, and environmentally sustainable and resilient. Does anyone have any thoughts on the, on the vision or otherwise? I know Laura and Gary, I believe, have already seen this. Um, feel free at any point to raise your hand and, and um, provide any feedback otherwise. Angela, did I see your hand go up there? Yeah, so in terms of, I've got a couple other things, but um, sure. if you're asking about the vision, I guess the first thing I was going to say is to go back to the OCP development, it says OCP is one of the policy tools to shape the development. And there's also comments about framework, reflecting community's vision. Um, and then the analysis, the one thing that I think that's missing is mm -hmm. about, uh, you know, sustainability, climate change, right. uh, some of that in terms of roles, shaping the development. So if we go back to the vision, um, I think that in my mind, I, I looked up the I looked up the definition for vision, and it says the ability to think about and plan the future with imagination or wisdom. That's the definition, and I find that the proposal, the proposed vision statement, is very static. It says Duncan is the most livable small towns. It is welcoming, but it doesn't give us anything for the future. Um, in some respects, even though the current one's very succinct, I think it says to be, it has a future, it mm -hmm. wants to be something. So whether it's to be the most livable, sustainable, small towns in Canada, at the same time respecting the traditional territory of the Quetzal Nation, and which is where it's located within, like it's more visionary. Like I find that the proposed, uh, the proposed vision statement is very static. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't allow, it doesn't, it doesn't give anything to speak to the future. So I think that's one thing I was thinking, um, you know, we don't want, like Duncan is one of the most livable, you know, one of the most livable small towns in Canada. It's, it's a statement that I'm sure that can be, even though I think it's a great town, but it's, it, it just makes it, uh, what do you call it, debatable. Let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. Like, is it really the most livable, or is it going to be the most livable? Or uh, it's it's a debatable statement. So, so I think that for a vision statement, I just find that it's not to the future. Mm -hmm. And I, I think in in the context of this vision statement, that the idea was to um, outline a vision that um, as the plan is completed and um, over the the course of the the life of this plan, twenty years or so, that this is the, the goal to strive towards, the vision to strive towards upon the completion of the plan. Um, so maybe it's more aspirational in that sense, and, but I understand the, uh, the language that you're speaking to. Should I go on? I guess you still, I, but. Well, I was just gonna uh, support what you're saying, Angela. I like, mm -hmm. I like the fact that the language um, in most vision statements, it has a goal. It's more of a goal statement instead of just a statement of what we are currently at. Um, I also think maybe reversing it and and leading it with um, identifying the location within the traditional territory of of uh, and as the opening statement is is uh, is important to do. Um, but I, I like the language part that you you brought up, Angela, for sure. Any other thoughts on the draft community vision? Move on swiftly then. So now, so moving into the, the land use component of this, I'm looking at current land uses in Duncan. There are currently uh, seven land use designations outlined in the official community plan, uh, including the, the low density residential, which we see in the, the light yellow, medium density residential, which is kind of that lighter orange, high density multifamily residential, the dark orange, um, along with a, a light pink color, which is commercial, blue, which is institutional, mixed use commercial residential and the, the light purple, and then the parks and environmental designation, which is the green. 
um, in our revisions of the land use designations, um, we have proposed uh, nine land use designations, um, not completely unlike the, the current designations with a, a little bit more variety. Um, so here we can see that the nine designations are neighborhood residential, uh, neighborhood commercial, urban residential, core transition, core residential, core commercial, gateway commercial, community, and parks and open space. I'll get into these in a little bit more detail in the next slide. So for the proposed residential land use designations, um, there are approximately five, um, each with unique land uses, building heights, and, and densities. They also have accompanying policies, which are included on the uh, project's Place Speak page. Um, they, can, they can be found under the resources section there. Uh, we'll just do a quick overview of what each of these designations looks like right now. Um, and refer back to the map quickly. So the neighborhood residential um, designation is um, what could be considered a, a traditional single family neighborhood. Um, in this case, we're considering single detached dwellings, duplexes and secondary suites with building height, heights up to about two and a half stories and a maximum of two units per parcel. If we refer back to the map, uh, that's the darker yellow color there. Um, so uh, largely found over in the Marchmont neighborhood along with the Centennial Heights and Cairnsmore neighborhoods. Uh, the second designation there is the neighborhood commercial designation, um, which would support commercial, residential and commercial mixed use and inter institutional uses, pardon me, uh, with building heights up to four stories and a density of approximately uh, 0.5 to 2.4 uh, floor area ratio. Um, if we refer back to the map, uh, that's the areas in kind of that um, lighter purple lavender color. Um, so there's a few nodes, for example, up in, in the Cairnsmore neighborhood and along the along Canada Avenue um, with some more focused around the coronation and on the uh, east side of the highway. And um, there's a, a few parcels there as well. Uh, the urban residential designation is the third designation, which would support duplexes, triplexes, townhouses, row houses, and low-rise apartments up to four stories, and supporting a density of approximately 0.5 to 2 point, uh, sorry, to 2 FAR, um, and that would be found in the areas shown in uh, the lighter orange there. So uh, you can see up in the Chesterfield area and adjacent to the highway corridor, um, along with some uh, more kind of sparse parcels uh, in both the Coronation neighborhood and up uh, around the Cairnsmore, Cairnsmore neighborhood node, excuse me. Um, the next designation is the core transition neighborhood, or sorry, core, core transition land use designation, pardon me, uh, which would support low rise apartments, townhouses, row houses, houseplexes, du duplexes, live work units, and residential commercial mixed use uh, with heights up to six stories. Um, and densities between 0.75 and 3 uh, FAR. The core transition is shown in the lighter pink. Um, so you can see um, some along the along Jubilee Road, for example, um, and in the Coronation neighborhood, and then it's kind of uh, interspersed in other areas of the community as well. The final of the residential land uses is the core residential land use. It's the low and mid-rise apartments, other uses like community care facilities and residential commercial mixed use. Um, again, up to six stories with slightly higher densities uh, supported in, in that land use designation between one and four floor area ratio. The core residential is the darker orange there. Um, so um, west of, of Jubilee alongside Centennial Park, um, a fair amount located in the Coronation neighborhood as well, and then also um, a block located east of the highway as well. Are there any comments or questions on those first five land use designations? Angela? You're yeah, muted, Angela. There. Okay, more of a, um, a clarification question. Sure. Um, so you've got neighborhood residential, which is more like single family mm -hmm. housing and neighborhood commercial. Um, 
and then urban residential. So can you explain neighborhood commercial and urban residential again? Sure, yeah. So neighborhood commercial is more kind of uh, what we would consider the neighborhood centers and, and mixed use neighborhood centers. Um, for example, up in the, the, the Cairnsburg neighborhood node, um, they're slightly higher density um, and also slightly um, support higher building heights as well. Um, and really are more focused on the commercial aspects as opposed to the neighborhood residential, which would be more of a traditional single family neighborhood. Um, and the urban residential is, um, I would say more focused on missing middle housing types. Um, uh, as opposed to the neighborhood residential and so slightly higher density and again slightly um, higher building forms as well. Okay so basically the, the only big difference like would neighborhood commercial have duplexes, triplexes or just straight kind of? Uh, typically typically use? not as, as we have it outlined so far. Um, it would be more focused on commercial uses. Uh, the intent is kind of to create those commercial nodes in neighborhoods that aren't established with them currently. So you could have like a little convenience store or a small grocery store similar to the Karensmore neighborhood currently um, so that people don't necessarily have to cross the highway to get their groceries and they have something in their immediate community. That's kind of the intent behind that so, or that designation. Okay. Any other thoughts, comments, questions? Yeah, Lauren? I think I said it in the last OCP meeting mm -hmm. as well, but I do think that um, just further consideration needs to be given to how the municipality of North Cowichan is developing their OCP, yeah. their designations right now. It's just the, the worst situation to be in would be if North Couchin is planning an eight story building and we're only planning here for up to four right mm -hmm. lot adjacent to it. So it's really, I, I feel strongly that North Couchin, maybe they're incorporating the city of Duncan into their planning, maybe not, but either way, city of Duncan needs to incorporate their plans into this as well. Great, thank you. There's no other comments or questions. I'll move on to the final few land use designations here. So these are primarily our, our non-residential land use designations. These include core commercial, which is um, a whole bevy of different commercial uses, including retail, craft industrial, office, restaurants, tourist accommodation, et cetera. Um, the heights here are supported up to six stories and a similar density to the core residential. So anywhere between one and four floor area ratio. Um, and th these could also include some residential commercial mixed use as well under the core commercial designation. Back on the map, that's the dark purple color. So, so primarily, primarily concentrated around downtown Duncan and along Canada Avenue. Sorry to be flipping back and forth here. Um, we have the Gateway Commercial Land Use Designation, uh, which again supports a whole variety of um, uh, commercial land uses along with uh, residential and commercial mixed use. Again, it's up to six stories with a slightly lower density supported between 0.5 and two floor area ratio. Um, and those areas are primarily focused around the highway corridor in that, in that dark red color. Um, so approximately uh, one block from, from highway one. The community designation is the uh, primarily the institutional land use designation, um, which would support schools, libraries, community centers, um, and essentially all other institutional uses supported in Duncan. Um, the building heights would be permitted up to four stories and, and the density would vary depending on the use, uh, leaving that rather open-ended. And then finally, the parks and open space designation um, is uh, essentially equivalent to the, the previous OCP and the, the parks and environmental land use designation. Those would be um, community and neighborhood parks uh, in the city, along with other uh, open spaces that could be valuable. Um, and no building heights and densities defined for those. So back on the map, the institutional uses are shown in blue, and then the parks and open space are shown uh, in green. Angela, does your hand? 
Yeah. Right. So um, <laughs> I could ask a crazy question, but so I'm going back, I'm, I'm looking at the proposed land uses and these are, and I'm going back to the visionary statement and thinking about the OCP and all that kind of stuff. And then I'm thinking to myself, when I'm looking at this, if you, if you look at all these designations and all that stuff, yeah, we read it all the time. But now that we have the opportunity, um, I'm going to ask the question, how do these fit into the vision statement that Duncan is the most livable small town and wants to be economic, culture? Like, How do these fit into that whole idea of being a small town? Or how does it fit into being an economic and cultural heart of the Cowshan Valley? Like, are we developing, like, do these, are, are these going to, like, how do, how do these translate, like, how does this vision translate to that designated land use? Mm -hmm. That's a great question, very deep question as well. Um, and I might get Matt to jump in on this as well, but I can take a first cut. Okay. Um, I think for, for the most part, the land use designations are, are trying to translate a lot of the uh, growth and uh, housing policies, for example, um, from, from the vision onto, onto the ground, essentially. And um, in doing so, attempting to um, ensure that um, the city can support a wide variety of commercial uses to be that commercial center, um, attempting to support a, a wider variety of housing opportunities to, to support uh, different um, uh, you know, existing residents, people um, wanting to move to Duncan and a variety of different households um, in the city. And then at the same time, ensuring that um, areas of environmental significance um, community significance are also maintained. Um, and for, for that livability aspect of it, ensuring that there are adequate services located close to people um, as needed, as Matt explained, through the neighborhood commercial, for example, but also institutional uses and, and park uses as well. Um, so I think it's a great point to, to be linking that back to the vision. And, and Matt, if I missed anything there or, or um, could be explained in better terms, uh, please feel free to follow up. No, I think you answered it really well. Like the the biggest thing is just providing a variety of options of housing. I think, and that really feeds into having a livable a livable town is giving a variety of options. And um, while we do have some options in our current OCP, this just really expands on it, especially with the missing middle housing. Um, so I think that will that will really feed into into the vision and just creating a more livable community for everybody. If I can jump in there is, oh, sorry. Um, we also decided that it was probably best to rename some of the land use designations as low medium density. When you think of that, I mean, they don't really translate well to what Duncan has and what Duncan would like. Um, for, as someone from Nanaimo, when I think high density, I think 10 plus stories. Whereas when we think high density in Duncan, we want you know to keep it at six max, make sure it's at a livable height. So we want to make sure that the land use designations correlate to what exactly we want. We want to make sure everything is kept at a neighborhood scale. And we want to make sure that what's in the core is designated to be in the core. And yeah. So, sorry, it's okay to talk? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, um, one thing, again, I'm just, I'm just looking. I'm, I'm not trying to solve anything. I'm just trying to look. So when I, when I'm looking at it, um, I'm looking at when you go from density, like I say, small town. Um, I guess I'm looking at trying to find where. What does livable mean? You know, I kind of say to myself, what does livable mean? And then look at some of these neighborhoods and, and streets. And, um, and I guess right now, downtown Duncan is on that lower, is it that lower? Oops, I'm pointing to the screen. Um, so the downtown Duncan is considered core commercial, right? Yeah. So core commercial, six stories, and livability. And I'm just trying to see livability in there. Uh, 
Um, well, yes, part, part of the, the design guidelines that we're, we're going to get to soon would, would help address some of those, those concerns. So that would be, would be kind of highlighting the guidelines for redevelopment of existing properties to make them more livable and to improve upon them and create uh, or create and establish standards for redevelopment. And that's kind of the intent of those guidelines um, is to make the city of Duncan more livable and to improve upon what's already here um, when existing properties come up for redevelopment. Don't forget that the, the vision statement says Duncan is already the most livable small well, town. That, that is a, that's kind of the, that statement was written to basically, that's like, at the end of this OCP, that's what's been achieved. That's how it was designed, was basically, it's not what it currently is, it's what it is at the end of the plan's life, um, is how it was written. I totally agree with the, the comments that you made at the beginning of, of this, um, where we could probably reword that, but that was the intent of the statement as, as written, was it's, that's actually the statement 20 years from now is what was achieved. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Owen, but I believe that was the intent. That is correct, yeah. But again, Angela, you're raising very valuable points and how that's worded and how, how people might um, understand the connection between the, the vision and uh, the land use designations, policies and otherwise. I would just like to kind of interject with what Angela was saying there as well, as I was thinking a bit more about the density and livable also means affordable. Uh, or, you know, affordability should be put into the concept of, li of livable. And when we're saying we some lots can have two units, I know in the previous conversation in the OCP advisory committee, um, they were talking about maybe three units on these uh, single family home lots where a suite in the house as well as a carriage house. And I was thinking more and more about that because when you go to get a mortgage, it, the price of land increases with how many units you can get on it. Therefore, um, affordability uh, decreases unless you have um, additional density on the land. And I do think that we're at this, the, this, this crux right now where Duncan used to be very affordable and all of a sudden in the past year to two years, it, it's no longer deemed like an affordable place and people are moving north to Crofton and Shimanus, which is a shame because we're just pushing people more and more up island. So I do think the density um, needs to be, we need to consider how many people like we want in the, in the core area of Duncan, what housing types there are, but just how to, how to, um, make affordability easier and not just, you know, an apartment or a condo, but also for single family homes as well. So it, it's, it's, it's an answer. I haven't seen a local government really do it well yet. Um, hopefully we can work a little more on it um, through the guidelines and stuff here, but I just wanted to chime mm -hmm. with that. It's definitely something we can consider moving forward and how we have considered one of the, the big challenges is a, a major section of our single family housing as is, is in a significant flood zone. Um, so that's definitely an added challenge to uh, addressing some of those concerns and affordability because that just creates more issues uh, moving forward. So it's it's something we're still actively looking into and considering, but like you said, it's it hasn't really been addressed, especially in lower mainland and Vancouver Island as of now. So definitely something we can continue talking about as we move forward. Uh, yeah, thanks, could, I, could I ask a question? Sure, go ahead, Gary. Owen, thank you, Owen. Uh, when, I, when I look at this plan, uh, especially up in the Cairnsmore area, I have lived there my whole life, mm -hmm. and, and I see, I see the, the chewing away, if you will, of the school board, school district property, uh, right. Those are all areas that we played on as kids. We played baseball, soccer, you name it, on those fields. They're getting chewed away, and I, and I don't see them being replaced here uh, with parks and open space. And, and um, in, in my area here, uh, up, by the, up by the old store and up at Duncan Elementary School and so on, it is changing dramatically, and I'm very concerned that with the livability side of things, especially as we put more and more people in the neighborhood with different zoning. We don't have a place 
for the kids to play, as it were. So, mm -hmm. uh, could you speak to that, please? Um, I don't know if I can speak specifically to that one lot. Maybe again, Matt can um, uh, provide a little bit more insight there. Um, that it has been a key concern uh, throughout is the amount of parks and open space and and uh, available um, throughout the community and and providing a balance of spaces uh, to make sure that not one community has more than another. And obviously, that's not necessarily achievable. Um, but as you're saying, definitely some uh, some of the neighborhoods have a greater access to parks and open space, um, and that's something that can be explored through the redevelopment process and and providing spaces for residents or public spaces as well. Um, but as you're saying, also making sure that, that the key spaces are preserved as well. Um, and I believe you noted that in the last meeting too, Gary. So um, it's it's on our list of things to, to be exploring through the policy, um, particularly in regards to parks and open space. So thanks again for that comment. Yeah, and I can just add just a little bit to that, but that's another thing in the, in the guidelines, we can develop um, policies and guidelines that, that speak to dedicating portions of land for larger developments that are park space and addressing that kind of tree canopy open space landscaping to improve that livability especially in areas that don't necessarily have a park space nearby um, so that's certainly something we can address through the guidelines and and the other policies in the ocp <laughs> angela so the, I'm, I'm just looking at the map and thinking about the whole thing about parks and, and public spaces that mm -hmm. you brought up. And the one thing I was thinking is that when I look, you know, what, what I do, I, I tend to focus on exactly what guidelines are given to me and then work within them. So this is a great opportunity because I'm looking at the whole thing. And I'm thinking that um, the, the one thing that this map seems to to I guess I'm, I'm focused on the core commercial as well as some of the residential areas most is that the core commercial just seems like there's no character to it. It's just a core commercial. I guess we have to go back into the guidelines and see how that all works out. But right now, um, you know, it just doesn't seem to have a, um, just doesn't have any green in there. It doesn't have any uh, mix of, it's just one dense area. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it it just seems, it, it just doesn't seem like a small town. It doesn't seem like it's, the character is not really, to me, I just don't, in my mind, when I, I jump into it as individual lots, I, I can't see how you can make it into something that's, that's um, back to the small town thing. The other part too, is that these residential areas, um, what I thought was quite cool, um, I'm not sure why that happened, but from the previous one to the new one, there's a new little pink park, like a neighborhood commercial popped up next to the residential area on um, Trunk Road. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Or is that, is that a, new, a new zoning thing? Just to address the whole idea that you've got to have some kind of commercial in that area, mm -hmm. be my guess. Then I thought to myself, you know, which is great. I, that's you know we need more of that kind of uh, accessibility to to services from, in neighborhoods. Um, then this whole area, that little green area on the bottom, um, is kind of surrounded by residential, and just wondering, I'm going to do something bad. I'm going to make the suggestion that says, you know, one of the most beautiful places are things like when I go. I haven't traveled a lot, but when I do travel, I've got these big public spaces and they're vibrant, they're vibrant spaces. They have, um, you know, big areas where people can gather. They have little shops and stuff there. They have a, a little a area that people can play whatever it is they want to play. And, and so it's a vibrant place. It's not just uh, quite different from kind of the, the North American Western thing where you just kind of go to a park and, just walk around, right? So, but there's so much residential around here on that little park there. I was wondering, you know, wonder if like a little kind of commercial area could kind of be in there where it becomes a center for people to go to. You know, yeah. that to me, that's kind of like, to me, when I look at a map like that, I kind of wonder how those, to develop kind of that idea. Um, 
And so I go back to that center core. It doesn't have anything in there that, that says to me to liven it up. It just seems it's dense. That's, and I'm just looking at the maps. I haven't gone to the guidelines yet. That's a whole different thing, but, but right. as a map. Yeah, I think both are good points. And um, as Matt mentioned, that uh, unfortunately, there's the constraint of the floodplain um, around McAdam and Rotary Parks. Um, yeah. The those parks themselves do have their own master plan, as you're probably aware. So um, changes are in the works. Um, maybe not so to the extent that you're speaking of, but um, from a programming perspective, um, those parks um, could be changing a little bit in the near future. Um, as for the the, the core area, um, I, I I agree that it, it does look uh, like a rather stark block, as opposed to some of the, the larger green spaces elsewhere. Um, However, in that area, I think it's uh, the focus is rather on um, smaller parks and plazas and open spaces contained um, within the commercial areas um, to, to provide a little bit of variety uh, in that area, as opposed to, to being able to find a, a, a large space to dedicate to parks, given the, the current constraints in the area and it already being largely developed. Um, and maybe Matt has, uh, again, some further comments on that. Yeah, it, there is the Station Street Park um, right next to, to the downtown core. Um, but I, I agree, it, it's because all of that purple looks so dense on the map, it's because it's all private property. Um, so until, um, until those redevelop and we can um, implement different strategies to gain spaces that are green and potentially become parks, um, as of right now, this is this is the reality as as it currently exists, and as things redevelop and move forward into the future, then maybe this map will change and more green and park dedicated park spaces can be added. Um, but as of right now, it, I, I agree it's it's very densely dark purple. Um, but hopefully, through establishing the guidelines and and policies of this OCP, we can we can start to address that and change it. You can't do things like that. This is a core commercial, but part of this core commercial is within certain areas, creates a bit of variety by saying it's got more, um, you know, less height in some areas, but you've got some variety of height in there. Because, you know, I just know clients, you know, they say you can do something and they're going to max it out. So um, anyways, that's what I see right now. For it. Mm -hmm. And again, I think they're all, all, all good points. And thanks, Angela. Gary. I, 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 oh, is it oh, Gary? Or? Oh, sorry. I was just uh, thanking Gary for his question. Oh, ahead, okay. <laughs> um, I'm just curious about um, one property within the block of purple that I thought was going to be green was the current lot on the corner of Station and Craig, the old red balloon building that is currently public space. Is that not being maintained? As a park, I would have to refer to Matt to that, but I, th I believe the intent is to to have a permanent design for Station Street Park. Correct? I believe so. Um, I think. Sorry, on the corner of where? I mi I missed part of that, Graham. Apologies. It's it's the old red balloon properties that's currently sort of a, a town square on the corner of Station and Craig. I believe it is. Yeah, so I, I think it's highlighted on the map just as a, a tiny little blue square um, in the green strip where Station Street Park is. Um, so it's very it's very much still planned to be part of that park. And if it's not right now, Graham, we can make that update. Yeah, too. we can. Yeah, maybe the, I thought that the big green strip in the middle is the Station Park. Um, and then uh, maybe the street park is just where that little kind of T-bone looking thing beside the green is. It's on the bottom left corner of that, I believe. Right here. Yeah, uh, I believe it's either there or the blue node just above that. I think it's the bottom one because there is the alley that you can access through there. But mm -hmm. where the Sorry, I I now under I know what you're talking about now. Um, or it might be the blue one just above that. I think maybe. Yeah, that I think that's. Um, 
I don't know if it's, it's definitely not a dedicated park as of now, but it's something that we could potentially move towards. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll have to look into that, Graham. I'm sorry, I don't know the exact status of that property as of right now, but um, it's certainly something we can look into uh, potentially designating as parkland or something along those lines. Okay, thank you. That park, I do think, is it's it's become important to the community downtown. It's <laughs> it, it brings a unique aspect to what is already like the unique area of downtown Duncan, but it really just gives it an extra step up. And it would be sad to see that redeveloped into something else other than Parkland. Right. Yeah. yeah, no. Oh, yeah. Sorry, it, it is that bottom little corner part. I'm just looking on the maps now. Yeah, I, I think it's 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 now become such a important piece to open space for downtown and gathering, um, you know, and a further redesign of it is, would, would be great. I also think there's opportunity in some of the, the parking areas that the city has acquired as flat parking and building up and building parkades and actually switching those open flat parking areas into green space as well downtown. There's some opportunity there to look into. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's something we did have a kind of more thorough parking inventory through the transportation and mobility strategy and trying to understand where those opportunities might be as well. So that's a great point to you. All right. Are we good to move on now? Any other comments, questions? I'm sure there'll be more discussion as we as we continue along here, but for the sake of time, we'll just keep moving forward here. All right, so we're getting into the development permit areas now and, and the directions for, for those. Uh, so the current development permit areas, there are currently six development permit areas. Um, obviously development permit areas can take a whole variety of different forms and functions. Um, they can guide form and character, they can guide reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. Um, they can also do, do things like mitigate hazards from, from steep slopes and flooding. And um, there's also development permit areas that can protect farmland. Maybe that won't apply in Duncan, for example. Uh, the six current development permit areas, as you're all well aware, are the multifamily residential, that's DPA one. DPA two is the downtown. DPA three is the highway corridor. DPA four is the other commercial areas. And then there's DPA five and six, which are natural environment and hazard lands. So in updating the development permit areas, there was a few objectives that we were looking to meet. Um, the first was to facilitate a high quality of design that reflects Duncan's existing character. And uh, second was to establish implementable guidelines that are not too complex to administer, um, something that Lauren was speaking to earlier on the, uh, the CVRD, uh, to find a balance between good design and constructability, uh, to provide flexible and adaptable guidelines that can support new ideas and designs, to match design requirements within proposed land use and community character for each area, and to incorporate existing valuable natural and built heritage into redevelopments where possible. So the proposed development permit areas um, in name are not uh, too different from the existing development permit areas. Um, the kind of five general development permit areas are the downtown, the highway one corridor, multifamily residential areas, neighborhood centers, which is essentially taking the place of the other commercial areas, and then the natural environment and hazard lands, including those riparian areas, steep slopes and flood areas. So we will quickly go through, or maybe not so quickly go through, the justification and key objectives for each of the form and character development parent areas, to those being uh, number one, numbers one through four. Um, yeah, at any time, I'll, I'll, I'll read through the justification and key objectives at any time if you'd like to jump in. Um, it'd be great to, to hear your thoughts. I know a few of you have comments already. Oh, sorry, Matt. Yeah, I'll just start uh, by reminding uh, the panel that if we don't, I, I know Lauren has to leave at noon. So if we don't get all your comments in or we don't get to discuss everything here, please send Kyle and I an email with your detailed comments and we'll make sure that um, both staff get it as well as urban systems so that we can incorporate your comments into our um, processes. Yeah, that's a great point. Consolidated comments are appreciated as well. Um, yeah, so we'll, we'll jump into the first DPA. And as I said, um, 
please feel free to raise your hand or, or jump in with any comments and questions as we go along, uh, since this is really an area where you can provide us with a lot of guidance and, and, and knowledge and all that would be much appreciated. Um, so for DPA1, the downtown, the justification is to facilitate a high quality development, sorry, to facilitate high quality development in downtown Duncan with form and character that is compatible with the area's existing character and that of surrounding neighborhoods. The six key objectives of the DPA are to retain a small town feel and preserve existing heritage building character, to ensure maximum efficiency of land use, to create an identifiable downtown district that is accessible from all areas from, of the city and highway gateways, provide a safe, comfortable and attractive environment for pedestrians, patrons and residents, to provide functional people-oriented people -oriented open spaces and or public gathering spaces, and provide retail and commercial space that serves the needs of residents and the surrounding community. So we won't be able to get into each of the individual guidelines, but I'm sure folks have, if they've had a chance to review, might have some comments already. So we'd be happy to discuss anything around, around the downtown development permit area now if, if, um, if there's any comments. I see Lauren and Angela, so maybe go to Lauren first. Thank you. I just, um, and this is kind of a comment for all the DPA areas, is I found that when I thought about how uh, the panel, like the, the applications that the panel seen within the past one to two years, and how developers have interpreted them, I feel that the wording in a lot of the guidelines seems to be stronger. I find there was a lot of should statements, but they should have, or that it would be better if they were shall statements, uh, and or strongly encouraged, things like that. Should I should the word has kind of led to a lot of developers thinking oh that can be ignored um mm -hmm. and overlooked and i feel that uh the duncan city council would also appreciate just more um firm guidelines into what we're looking for so for instance when um i don't really know i think a lot of the design guidelines said it but it's, it talks about stepping back of buildings and it just should um you know the fourth mm -hmm. story and above should be stepped back we haven't seen one where it is stepped back yet. A lot of them are actually requ requesting variances for height increases and things like that. And I would really like to see, you know, that one in particular, it shall be stepped back. Um, it, it's really important, especially because Duncan is just starting to grow and these bigger developments are just starting to get off the feet. They're the first of their kind in the neighborhood. So they're still surrounded by single family homes for the most part. And it's just not respecting um, the, the neighbors that are already there and may be there for the next hundred years, if they don't ever develop, mm -hmm. um, you need to show more respect to the, um, current surrounding community and be firm about it. Um, there's other things in here where, uh, one of them said, you know, minor variances to building height. Well, what's minor? Because, mm -hmm. you know, go from one developer to another, you know, minor variances of one meter or less, something like that, just more specific wording. And I will provide comments later, like behind the scenes of my specifics on each, you know, comment. But just, um, and also, we are also finding that um, something I want to bring up for the panel members is we're finding that most developments, especially larger ones, are requesting parking variances. And I brought up in our previous meeting, well, no one's keeping track of all these variances and eventually they all add up. And, but no, there's no set way to figure out how many spots we're actually missing from the overall parking count that should be there. So, you know, how, um, how many parking spaces are permitted to be varied for, for each development. And I think more thought needs to go into that. And maybe um, if, a, if parking's varied, what, a developer has to provide, whether that be, you know, as many bikes, parking spaces per bedroom in each unit or something like that. I do think that it needs to be harder to support a parking variance without providing other amenities on the site, as well as without considering who, what developments around the area, whether they're built or not, um, have also um, been provided parking variances. I think leave it as that, right? Oh, one other thing for this one is just, I, I don't feel the wording is strong enough to protect the heritage, heritage elements on buildings. It's a lot of sh um, should statements as well. Mm -hmm. And the whole Duncan is, we call it historic downtown Duncan. Well, let's keep it that way and let's help them keep it that way um, by being very firm in how we're going to protect it. And I will leave it at that for now. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I can just, uh, I completely agree, Lauren. Uh, staff has, we've started going through these guidelines and actually circling all the shoulds, the encourages, the, and, and items like that. And we're, we're also wanting to strengthen the guidelines. Um, and just briefly about parking, um, one of the things that um, we have been discussing internally is um, requiring um, parking studies to be undertaken um, in the event that a developer is requesting a variance and having a, a party that is hired by the city actually evaluate the project and determine what is an appropriate amount of parking um, and requiring those for all parking variances to help to help establish that rather than having it be a guessing game as to what is appropriate is actually having a, a professional determine that. Um, so that's one of the things that we're going to be moving towards to help uh, address that. Were there any comments uh, on top of those that Lauren provided or uh, additional to Angela? Oh, okay. So, um, yeah, those are good comments. Um, I guess when I, when I look at this, the couple things, one is uh, facilitate high development I look at it as somebody that's trying to fit into this thing, but, um, and there's things like compatible with areas existing character and that of the surrounding neighborhood, preserve existing heritage building character, um, objectives facilitate high quality design of Flex Duncan's existing character. Um, so I guess we have to figure out what that existing character is it'll change as it moves, develops, right? I would think. So to me, that's kind of something that is too, um, and you know, the picture that's in the, in, in that you presented next to Duncan's existing character is a single family house with a gable that's quite cute and a white picket fence, but, um, and then there's another one that shows the residential and commercial, but I think it, it doesn't, I guess what I'm, I guess in my mind, this doesn't quite click with downtown when it says downtown, six stories, you know, higher density. Uh, what, what is the character that that's trying to, um, what is it, what are you trying to get to? Uh, so I guess that's one thing. Um, in terms, again, back to your point in terms of, um, it, some of these things have to be more definitive as to has to fit into what that character is because as working with a lot of clients, they're going to say, you know, everybody pushes the limits in development. That's, that's what happens. And um, it's all part of economics. So I think these things have to be more defined and, and firm um, so that people can work within it. So they know what the limits are, what can be done. Um, the other thing I was going to say in terms of parking is, from my experience, is that you can get variances in parking and push parking, but at, you know, uh, land is limited at one point or another where you put all these cars. So, you know, that's that's one thing I keep thinking: where are we going to put all these cars? Is Duncan going to build a a parking lot or a underground parking that when you do a variance, we can put these cars somewhere else or? So I think that has to be, keep taking this one thing. So anyways, that's all I have. Graham or Gary, did you have any thoughts at this point? Okay. Thanks for all that feedback. That's great. And um, appreciate you jumping in there as well, Matt. Um, so the second DPA is the Highway 1 corridor. Justification for that is to help create a, an economically viable, safe, and beautiful gateway corridor that effectively balances the highway's chief function, moving vehicles through town safely and efficiently, and improving access to businesses by all modes of transportation. Two key objectives here are to create a main street feel by bringing buildings close to the street, widening sidewalks, creating areas for social interaction, and designing street-oriented commercial areas to encourage more walk-by pedestrian traffic. Number two, to consolidate vehicle access and parking areas and improve cycling and walking facilities to create safe and attractive spaces for pedestrians. Um, any thoughts, um, questions, curiosities on the uh, Highway 1 corridor? 
DPA. Lauren, go ahead. I'd like to see the incorporation of more landscaping or greenery on mm -hmm. the corridor. Um, I found that the DPA guidelines, you know, talked about sidewalks and buildings and, but I, you know, that, that sidewalk corridor itself is used very heavily every day and it's quite unwelcoming when you're mm -hmm. using it. You don't feel safe as a pedestrian. Um, it, you know, there's no traffic, like there's no noise reduction, natural noise reduction put in place. There, there's just nothing but a concrete jungle there. And I'd really like to see, although it is a highway corridor, technically it is still essentially the, cent uh, uh, the center of Duncan as well. So it needs to be treated in a different manner than just a, a, an average highway corridor. And I feel that the design guidelines were almost trying to um, really make prevalent like large buildings. I think at one point I read something like um, buildings where it was something about the massing of up to six stories might not need to be um, stepped back if it's at a corner or intersection. I thought no, because it's still the middle of a small downtown area. And I feel that's going in the exact opposite direction of warm and friendly and welcoming. It's more imposing and more concrete mm -hmm. area that's already um, very, very dense. Um, so how do we make it more livable and friendly there? And I don't feel the design guidelines have really um, helped that uh, right now. And I do have further comments, but I'll, I'll send them in writing later. Okay. Angela. Um, does, does Duncan have any um, plans for like, you know, in terms of it's, it's a major highway or it's a highway, country, but is there any like just to, to kind of uh, make a transition area? So is there any kind of uh, plan that says this is, this is really busy then there's a transition area to, walk to either side that's less busy um, and so on and, and develop the road in such a way that it's a gradient of, of environments. So when people are planning, they can actually plan to those gradients. Like um, for example, if it's busy, a pull off or, um, or secondary road, or like you say, landscaping or some, some kind of gradient that moves uh, uh, activity so it's actually a plan and envisions where those those activities so that when as people develop along that that road or that highway, um, it builds onto a, a concept or a, a plan that will start establishing these these kind of transitions to to different zone zones. That's the word I was looking for. Different zones. So let's say you've got a fast moving zone. You've got a secondary zone that works through, then you or a landscaping zone, and then a secondary zone, and then you enter the zone, and then you build the zone. So it allows at least some kind of plan for the highway because right now it's a mishmash. People are coming in and out, and you don't know if you can go into that. You know, it's it's so if if there was some kind of overall, and it, you can't leave it to individual developers to develop it because then one person does one thing and somebody does something has to be, I think it, I think maybe that that has to be established somewhere on that highway. So that, the, so as, as you develop those properties, each one starts to build on that overall concept rather than a mishmash of things. Mm -hmm. um, I can, so I can kind of speak to this. Um, I'll have to look into it a little bit more, Angela, but with, with the highway um, kind of the, the direction we've been given from um, MOTI is essentially that all future development won't be able to access or have access off of the highway. So they're, tr they're actually trying to eliminate driveway drops and access directly from the highway. So that would mean um, just through that, um, there would kind of be that transition zone that you're talking about where now access will have to come from secondary streets. Um, so that will kind of create uh, a situation where people actually have to leave the highway and, and move into um, the city itself to access these new developments. So it, um, through we don't have a ton of control over the highway because that's, that's all the ministry um, that controls that, but them basically not permitting new accesses 
um, kind of creates a scenario where we can try to achieve what you were talking about through redevelopment. So if that's the case, if they're doing it, then my next thought is that then this whole planning has to move right into, I'm just going to look at the map here. Now that you mentioned, so hold on a second, I'm sorry. And I'm thinking to myself, if that's the case, then you've got gateway commercial all through here. So maybe the planning has to move the actual zoning and development and planning and all that kind of stuff. I look at this map, I'm thinking, maybe that knowing that highway is going to do that is start establishing a really nice secondary corridor, like somehow or another look at that zoning to say, Hey, is there a possibility that if we have to move off the highway, can we create an, an, a secondary route that is treed? It's nice or do all that kind of stuff. Cause right now it just shows blocking. I'm just, yeah, and I should clarify when I say access, I, I only mean vehicular access. Um, so create so there would still you could still have businesses fronting onto the highway and have entrances onto the highway, but they would be pedestrian in nature and yeah. all of the, the cars would be at the back. So there's certainly an opportunity to create a nice environment um, that's almost serving as a buffer between the highway and those those entrances. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Do you have anything to add on or? No, I think those are all good points. And um, obviously the ministry, as you said, does have um, authority there and they have done some planning around that through the highway corridor studies in the past. Um, and it's also being addressed through the transportation mobility strategy as well to, to try and um, um, maybe um, define a different kind of cross section and more pedestrian oriented street cross section there as well. So maybe speaking more to to those zones, Angela, and um, introducing more kind of consistent landscaping otherwise. And uh, could I just add to that, please? Absolutely, Owen. And yeah. and to Matt, uh, when we're when we're looking at uh, our highway corridor, which is really what it is, and are we are we putting some emphasis on? Uh, egress and entrance or whatever you call it with uh, turning lanes off off of the main uh, corridor so that you can go on to say coronation or uh, 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 turn off uh, onto uh, trunk road uh, are there are there uh, are people looking at that so that that can be uh, uh, make the highway smoother and easier and uh, people can turn and get get off the highway quicker yeah, um, that is, again, more focused on the transportation mobility strategy side, but um, it has been part of the, kind of the traffic modeling and seeing where uh, improvements can be made to flow um, onto and off of the highway. And I think both coronation and trunk uh, were being considered for, for some slight rearrangements in order to, prevent, uh, to permit those, those right-hand movements. Um, so uh, that's all going to be contained in, in uh, the transportation mobility strategies working paper two, um, which is being developed right now. I mean, right right on the corner of Coronation and the highway, they've got machines in there flattening that area out for, mm -hmm. I guess, for putting vehicles on, I suppose. And would, would that have been a time for the city to have taken a uh, right turn uh, alley off that piece of land right now? Uh, I don't know how you do it when they're all privately owned. I have no idea, but uh, would that be something to look at right now? Because it's all flat and there's nothing there, not a building, nothing. And uh, wouldn't that be a great time to make a, a, a turning right lane at least in one spot? Anyway, thank you. That's a great note. And I can refer that back to the, the, the transportation mobility strategy team. Were there any other thoughts, Matt, Scram? All right. So next we are moving into DPA number three, multifamily residential areas. So the justification for these is to ensure the form and character of multifamily residential development is high quality and well integrated into existing neighborhoods as to enhance livability and support a sustainable built and natural environment. 
where these areas will apply is uh, in the identified multifamily residential areas in the urban residential, core transition, and core residential land uses outside of the downtown and highway corridor development permit areas. The key objectives are to provide a healthy, safe, and livable environment for residents and to ensure multifamily residential development is compatible with surrounding land use objectives, complements the social and environmental goals of the OCP, and is constructed to high standards, both materially and aesthetically. Any thoughts or comments there? Go ahead, Lauren. Um, I think just a little more emphasis needs to go on the amenities provided on the site. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel a lot of the developments we've seen recently are asking for variances in terms of height, in terms of setbacks, in terms of parking, just to make the building as big as possible, um, you know, to cover all the floor space available to them, but not provide the amenities. And then we're finding more and more stress on kind of the parks in the area where they say, oh, there's a park two blocks away. And it's like, well, it's just kind of like the same parking issue is everyone's relying on these parks two blocks away and the parkland in the city is not increasing. However, the population is. So I feel like amenities must be provided on the sites, um, whether that be through covered balconies, balconies that are larger than kind of like one by three, um, uh, green, like green roofs or usable green roofs, uh, spaces, things like that. But amenities must be present on the site and an amenity isn't a bike rack. It's, you know, usable space for the people living there. Mm -hmm. Angela? Um, I just, I, I always kind of, when I read healthy, safe, and livable environments, it's a, it's a big, big statement. Um, but they're all kind of related to sustainability. So, um, you know, but, you know, there's so many ways to, to present it. Um, is there any sustainable requirements from in Duncan? And um, is that part of, but provide a set, you know, key objectives, health, safe, and livable environments. I think that, I guess my mind, I go healthy. What is healthy? And what is safe? I think those have to be more mm -hmm. kind of uh, thought about and, and, uh, and things put in place that says these are kind of the guidelines, the, you know, the actual guidelines that what we consider acceptable for health and safety, um, rather than just say health and safety. Right. I think that's one of the things. Um, Matt, are you able to elaborate on that question around sustainability? Yeah, so um, in, internally, just with staff, um, we haven't fully fleshed this idea out, but we're hoping to um, add in a, an additional development permit area that's actually citywide, and that area will speak specifically to environmental sustainability and provide guidelines um, for that. And that, that would be a citywide um, guideline. So it's something we're talking about internally um, to add to all of this, but I don't have any guidelines to show you right now because we're still working on it, but that, that's something we're hoping to include to address specifically what you were talking about. Great, thanks, man. Did anyone else have any thoughts or comments on multifamily residential areas, DBA3? Sorry, Grammy Gary, I'm having to flip through my Zoom here and actually find and see if you're waving at me. Um, all right, we will move on then. Uh, the last DPA we're going to talk about today, last of the form and character DPAs currently defined in the, in the, in the draft guidelines is, is the neighborhood centers, uh, previously the other commercial areas. Um, the justification on this is to recognize that commercial activity exists, currently exists in the two large neighborhood centers of Coronation Street and Cairnsmore, and that additional activity in these is both likely and desirable, along with supporting other vibrant neighborhood, neighborhood centers where necessary. Um, this DPA applies in areas identified for commercial and residential commercial mixed use as defined in the neighborhood commercial and core transition land use designations again, outside of the downtown and Highway 1 corridor DPAs. Um, the key objectives are to support the development of neighborhood nodes, which provide convenient services within easy walking distance of residential areas, 
And again, to ensure the commercial development within neighborhood centers is compatible with surrounding land uses, complements the social and environmental goals of the OCP, and is constructed to high standards, both material and aesthetic. Thoughts, comments, questions here? Angela? Um, so I was just thinking, uh, like the picture that you have, I wouldn't exactly call that a neighborhood, like a, you call it a, um, I guess when I, okay, so part of it is when you have neighborhoods and in terms of uh, little commercial neighborhood centers within it, I find that um, it's not just one piece of property. It's actually more of a, should be a little area that's, that's more kind of social. Um, and more like a, it could even become more like a focus for the neighborhood because everybody goes there to, to do their little shopping and stuff like that. Um, mm -hmm. So I guess that's my, the, in terms of nodes and in terms of looking at your map, one thought I thought was quite interesting is that little uh, inclusion of that little corner for on trunk road for a neighborhood. Is that something that just came up or did you, like, how does that, how did that come about? I'm curious. I think for, for those particular parcels, it was just exploring the fact that there was pretty limited neighborhood commercial on that side of, of the highway and looking for a location that might be suitable, um, might be suitable for that. And since it's had a fairly prominent intersection, um, that that could be an appropriate location. Um, obviously, it could be subject to change if, if there's more appropriate locations. Um, or if you feel like that's not, uh, if, if neighborhood commercial is not needed on that side of the highway. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's, it's a prominent but, location. Yeah, but um, is there anything, any opportunities for the other side? Because you always have to cross trunk road to get there if you live in the residential area on the other side, right? Mm -hmm. They're always Maybe. crossing that road. Mm -hmm. There may be, that's a great point. Um, I can't say. It's just that it just seems like, you know, I, I like the air. It's definitely a concerted point to, to have something there because there's so much residential there. Um, and it might be a great place for all the residential on one side, but there's so much yellow on the other side that has nothing in it. That's the only problem. And I think that for me, a commercial node is, um, no matter how small it is, it's, uh, it, it'll should be more of a, a place to go rather than just a piece of property. So I like it that the pink, that that little piece that you have across the place is, um, it's got more lots rather than one single one. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's something for, for us and, and Matt to discuss further. Um, but yeah, great, great point. Thanks, Angela. The other, the other thing that could be looked at mm -hmm. in, uh, in the 49th parallel store area there and and also the school property uh, to the to the east of this directly to the east of this that would be an area in my view that uh, a park area could be designated uh, because this this area this area we're looking at here with the store there that's my old store and that area has been there for a lot of years and yes a commercial a commercial node in there is great if that's what they're called, but we're missing park area for this this area. And I think that if we move east of this store here down Karensmore is a, a awesome spot for uh, a park area, which it used to be until the school board put uh, the uh, the trailer thing on there for childcare, which is being moved. But uh, what a good time now! There's nothing on there to designate some parkland in this neighborhood, um, uh, keeping, keeping this commercial as it is, and then looking at some of the other area there as park. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great point, Gary. Thanks for the, the specific recommendation as well. I think in these uh, neighborhood centers in particular, like it would be really interesting to explore, you know, say Gary's idea is feasible and that land could be, you know, slated to be parkland or some of it could be slated to be green space, but to explore how 
the green space could increase as, as close, uh, closer you get to the property. So for instance, let's say 49th parallel or um, the store in front of it, I can't remember what it is. You need to incorporate green space or kind of a, a public meetings or a you know, seating area that, so the buildings are set back further from the road and not just at the corner. And that there's that natural kind of um, space where people meet and can sit or can, you know, Mm -hmm. their dog when they go into the store and things like that. And it just increases kind of like as a triangle, well, as you get closer to the parkland, something that just, you know, says parkland's coming, more green space is coming. I do feel that we're really, the guidelines are really focused on, um, you know, talking about what should what should be stepped back and, you know, long featureless walls and things like that, but not how, what the building feels like from the outside, from a pedestrian standpoint and how pedestrians are going to use that public private realm there. Um, it would just be really great to see more incorporation of the walkability and the usability of for the areas. I, I'm just concerned that um, if I can jump in one more time, that this whole thing becomes commercial, if you will, uh, and and that we we forget that we don't have any green space being added to the area and the school board has their property. I don't know if you guys have looked up there at the school board property. they they got an area they're parking trucks and stuff on on our old playing field and, and they they have taken the north part of the property along College Street and they're putting a child care thing in there, which is fine, but those are all playground areas, if you like, for the kids in the region and that is being depleted. So I think we should address that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think just to add on to that as well, what Gary's saying as well, I, I, I don't remember which design guideline I set it in, but it said, you know, a minimum of 10% of the space would be landscaped. And I thought, well, that means that's a lot of concrete that's going to go on there if only 10% is landscaped. However, when but I think that was more for, you know, higher density residential, but in these cases for neighborhood centers, we, there is a percentage of the land possibly in a guideline that is landscaped or is green or is, um, not planned for vehicles or parking bikes it is actively planned to be green because i do think you know what angela keeps saying about the mapping and the colors is the color that's missing is green is public space um, especially when these new developments are all asking for variances all the time and not incorporating the livability into the design and we as a panel and council have to um, you know, recommend approval for these properties on a lot by lot basis, as opposed to kind of thinking holistically about what the area around it is, and to help us all make more um, influential decisions on how the community is going to grow as a whole, as opposed to lot by lot, would be very helpful. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Lauren. Thanks, Gary. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's definitely something we can incorporate and explore a little bit more. And um, if you have any specific ideas around that, add those in your um, consolidated comments and we can we can go through those as well. Um, One thing just to add, since we're on the, the topic, it'd be, sure. it'd be really helpful if um, the panel could provide comments on strengthening our landscaping guidelines. Because um, as Lauren said, there is a policy that basically says anything that's not used for building, parking, pedestrian movement should be landscaped, um, but, but it doesn't define how that should work and how that should look. So um, I, the, I'm looking at Graham specifically, but the whole panel, um, it would be really appreciated if you could provide your ideas and comments on, on how we can strengthen um, providing landscaping and actually develop that into guidelines that can help us move forward with something that's um, fits better within each development. Angela. Um, going to that point and for somebody that works with people developing properties is that um, the landscaping guideline, I, I wonder if has any has anybody ever done like a, a citywide landscaping concept plan? Like city, 
yeah, to what and what that is, and maybe that's where we should start looking at it before we can comment. Okay, it'd be hard to make those comments without knowing if the city has an overall plan of parks and links and you know special streets that are tree lined and small little kind of places that people can sit in, like all that, how that all links together. Um, anyways, that's, that's my. Some cities do have that where they, you know, have boulevard design guidelines, but the boulevards aren't there yet. It's meant to be incorporated as the development, as development um, continues. Um, and it is helpful. And it is, you know, once developers are aware that they're, you know, this is a must, not a, not a should, mm -hmm. um, you know, it just becomes known. Oh, and Duncan, that's what you have to do when you develop there. And it's just something that becomes known in the community. And I do agree. I think, you know, I feel that these design guidelines are leading developers to start first with the building and then with how the lot is going to go around it, as opposed mm -hmm. to the opposite. It should be what is the landscaping and what greenery and what, how is the public going to act, interact with the space? And then the building comes after it's very easy. And you kind of listen to developers conversations to realize, you know, they have 50% lot coverage to work with. And therefore that's, that's the forefront in their mind is okay. 50%. What are my setbacks? What can I shove in the little areas around it? It needs to be the opposite. The thinking needs to be, um, green space first, building second, but building also the, the design and quality of the building is also important after the landscaping. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Uh, do you have those examples offhand, Lauren, of um, communities that do have those boulevard design guidelines? I'm pretty sure the city of Nanaimo has just started one uh, right. for Nickel Street. Um, the town of Aurora, I think, has something like that. I can I can kind of look into others. But thinking of that as well, um, a, a big thing I think is missing in the design and uh, of, I, I was reading some of the design guidelines, but is accessibility for people of all, with all forms of disability. So, you know, uh, people who have vision, um, vision impairment, hearing impairment, things like that. I do appreciate, I, I saw in there, you know, different textures for, um, you know, when when underground parking is going to meet the sidewalk areas like that, and that's great. But uh, the town of Aurora does have disability standards or something, accessibility, universal accessibility, that is, I think it's award-winning. And um, they just incorporating, because the city of Duncan's aging, um, the, the population's aging, and so is the infrastructure, which means it needs to be replaced, which is a great thing if it can be done thinking of who needs to use it and what means, because a lot of people think access, uh, dis a disability is just a wheelchair when that is not the case at all. Um, you know, and there's different forms of disability. Um, you can be temporarily disabled. You can be situationally disabled, for instance, like, you know, a parent with a baby in their arms walking on the street as a situational disability. And that's just not really um, thought of in these design guidelines. I don't think to the extent it could be to make Duncan truly like a wonderful, fully inclusive place to, to walk around and to experience. And totally great point. I think the other part too, is that I don't think all these, like if we look at disability things, it doesn't have to look like a, dis, a city for disabilities like some of these ideas can be uh can beautiful right they can actually be part of the whole scheme that makes duncan like for example sidewalks you know sidewalk designs can be for disability but it could be quite could be quite fun um you know transitions to different areas returning or uh you know view lines I, yeah so i think that the other part too is that the whole to also combine some of those challenges with sustainability guidelines. So we get disability statement, those can actually work together as, um, as uh, making Duncan a uh, more livable. That to me, that's livable. That's starting to talk about livability. Mm -hmm. So those are the aspects which I, like just to say livability to me is ooh, whatever, but when you start incorporating some of those, I think that would be, that starts to make sense to me. Yeah, that's great. I appreciate the idea that these improvements can make life better for, for everyone. So um, thanks, Angela. Thanks, Lauren. Um, and it sounds like it's worth looking at the town of Aurora. It sounds like it's a happening place. Um, 
any other oh graham i see your hand there sorry uh, i just wanted to reiterate about the accessibility um and integrating mm -hmm. that uh, at a greater detail in the dp uh, uh guidelines because as lauren stated it doesn't go far than far enough really um it's such an important part now um that it needs to be i mean it the language in here is all should as well, right? It should do this, should do this. And we're seeing as a, as a um, uh, advisory design panel, we're seeing the bare minimum and it's not, it's, it's resulting in not um, attractive, inviting spaces. And I think like, like Lauren was saying is it needs to be strengthened the language as well as uh, the, the scope of accessibility. And, and like what Angela touched on it, the, Increasing accessibility doesn't need to make it seem institutional or anything like that. I mean, you go to urban places that are really pushed uh, accessibility. It all it does is create much more inviting open spaces. Uh, it's not, you know, it, it just is more inviting. Um, you know, the general landscape comments. You know that uh, I think Matt was was that you know saying hey. You, some, some direction. I mean, a lot of cities are leaning on complete streets to help them define what they're looking for as far as boulevard uh, sort of stuff. Um, and I think it's, it's something that Duncan should look at as far as including some sort of guidelines for developers. So like what Lauren was saying is, hey, <clears throat> the city of Duncan standard is this, and this is really what they're looking for. <clears throat> so developers, know that that that's where they need to start because they need to integrate what they're designing to fit into that complete street uh, interface that the city really desires and it'll address some of the 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 the, the concerns that Gary's talking about is that greenway and I know that there's a, a circulate a traffic and and circulation plan but that's where you can integrate it into the traffic is that pedestrian level you know interface um, with the traffic you know, it's really important those corridors, that sidewalk boulevard corridor is going to be, you know, a real important place for Duncan because we don't have the, the green space, the parkland coming across as new space. So that boulevard is really an important piece of public infrastructure for public gathering, public space. So that's where I think it is valuable, very valuable for the city of Duncan to look at the um, better de definitions of the boulevards and and integration into the building and right onto private property like I think Lauren was saying before is that uh, them providing amenities on that in, in that interface level that extends right through into the boulevard because we need that the city needs that that vibrant green activity space uh, you know in in the uh, boulevard area and it needs definitions. I, can I add just Go ahead, Angela. Yeah. one more is that I think that just as a, a, a note is for all the people that I've worked with, I think most, even though I think most people want to max out and do everything, but if you give, if you give somebody a vision for the city or for a street or for something that's exciting and will be, that they're proud to be part of, they'll buy into it. You know, they really will. But I think it's actually Duncan that has to present that because as an individual lot and individual developer, they, they just, they're there to look at that project. But if they see that they can, that they can be part of something bigger, um, that's when most, that's when things change. Then you're not getting that, oh, just put it on. We've got to make the dollars and do all that kind of stuff. Then it's like, wow, you know, we can, let's, I don't mind putting that there because it's going to make it better my projects could be nicer it's going to be part of the whole city so i think that um in terms of all these guidelines and things i think it's it has to come from duncan to have that vision so going back to that vision statement um right back to the first sheet um i think that that you know some of this has to go into all the different aspects of, of the different you know you've got the one big vision but i think in each neighborhood there's got to be little vision statements as well, not just objectives, but a vision. Of what is this going to look like? What is that community going to look like? Like Duncan's got to take that lead to 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 make it happen. Anyways, yeah, thanks, Anyways. Angela. And and for Hi. some areas, that's being done. Oh, sorry, Gary, did I cut you off there? I 
Can I just say one more little quick thing? And I think yeah. uh, kudos, kudos to to planning and everybody in the city prior to my time. But uh, the Karensmore, uh, this Karensmore Street, where all the I think there's 20 to 30 trees they planted. We 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 planted uh, along Karensmore, and I think that's uh, just a vast something we can build on for sure, and a vast improvement. Uh, I know it's just a strip down there, but it, uh, with the little bump outs and so on, it's made uh, quite a nice, in the springtime when all that comes out in bloom and green, it's beautiful. Thank you. Thanks, Gary. What Gary's saying, Karen's more should be like a minimum standard of, of street, of, of, of a, you know, a, a neighborhood center or something street. I don't mean the off streets with just the single family homes, but Karen's more is a good example of a friendly space like it's working towards that and it has a lot of potential to be um mm -hmm. fabulous if the right guidelines are in place to help it along mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um i guess to to angela's point sorry is that um a lot of the the neighborhood visions might come out of uh, further local area planning um activities like has been done in the mm -hmm. Cairns more sustainable neighborhood plan and university village plan um, but also in the um, transportation and mobility strategy, like I mentioned for the highway corridor, is that there is being some effort putting into developing standard cross sections that um, are a little bit more um, geared towards complete streets. Um, so um, there are already cross sections in the Cairnsmore neighborhood plan that are more specific to that node. Um, but that could be a first step into um, incorporating better landscaping, um, higher uh, standards for pedestrian infrastructure, cycling infrastructure, and ensuring that there's amenities in the boulevard space as well. Just in terms of um, what you were saying there with the, with the, there's images and stuff that are presented and I really like that. The one thing I did notice though, is they start with what you should not do and then they show what you should do. And I think it should be the opposite. It should show what you should do. And that image should be a lot larger than what you mm -hmm. should do, um, but also include the image of what should not be, but really just put it in the forefront in people's minds as this is what is the minimum standard. And also stress like, you know, these guidelines are the minimum. Like if you want to go above and beyond, like we'd love to hear your ideas of how you want to make it a great space. Mm -hmm. Um, because I think with all of our ideas, it's, it's easy to go and then make guidelines too prescriptive, which then also limits, um, the imagination and, you know, it does turn off some developers. However, development itself is expensive. It's not for everyone. Um, and that needs to also be, you know, reiterated to the public is that you just can't buy a lot and do what you want on it and the budget you want. Um, there is money involved in development. It doesn't need to be astronomical but there is a cost to development so we will not be accepting um you know oh we can't afford to do that <laughs> we can't afford to step back the fourth story and above that because that raises the price well i'm sorry then maybe we just stop the building at four stories then you know we need to have minimums but we also need to encourage imagination as well great thanks lauren I understand we're edging towards the end of our time here. So if um, any other thoughts, comments on, um, I guess, any of the development preliminaries that we've talked about so far? Gary, did you have a thought? Just, just one more. Just the <laughs> word uh, that Lauren and Angela have been speaking to very, very well, thank you very much, uh, is the livability of the city and, <laughs> and, and these areas. I think that is where we must just have a huge focus, livability, Beauty and livability, and uh, and I, I and I know all these other things are very important, but that's the main thing. When when I'm walking down Karensmore Street, it's uh, it's pretty nice. So thank you. Great, thanks, Gary. If there's no other comments at this point, maybe we can um, move on to the last couple of slides here, talking about next steps, and then. Um, as we've discussed throughout, um, if you can provide the co your comments, that would be amazing. And we can, um, uh, I've been writing down notes as we go along here, but if you have more specific comments and uh, uh, questions or otherwise that uh, pertain to the specific guidelines, then to provide those back to Matt and Kyle, and um, we can incorporate those as best we can to, into the future guidelines. Um, are we good to proceed here? All right. 
So our last couple of slides. So next steps in phase two in community engagement. So phase two community engagement is taking place right now. Um, in terms of the these activities, there are um, update project updates and surveys currently live on the respective place speak uh, sites for both the OCP and the transportation and mobility strategy. Uh, they'll be open from February 14th to March 14th. Um, so uh, I think that's another two and a half, three weeks. Um, there's a prize available if you want to spread the word and make sure people um, uh, are aware that the surveys are going on. Um, we also have two uh, virtual open houses that will be um, involving both the transportation mobility strategy team and, and the OCP team. And those are taking place next week, uh, one in the afternoon on March 2nd at 1 p.m. and the second uh, March 6th at 6 p.m. Uh, you can get in touch with the folks um, uh, with uh, Spencer, I believe, to, to sign up. So the folks at the planning department uh, at the city of Duncan. And then uh, in terms of the upcoming community engagement activities, the last is, is to, to go back to, to Cowish and Tribes to discuss progress on the project. Um, ultimately, the plan will be referred back to them as well. Here's a more kind of detailed schedule going forward with some tentative dates, dates thrown at them. So we have phase two consultation until mid-March, that update to Cowish and Tribes uh, towards the end of March. Uh, we're going to be updating the draft OCP based on community input, input provided by the advisory committee and yourselves here on the advisory design panel, um, hopefully for the end of March. Returning to the OCP advisory committee in the early April with another open house in mid-April, mid -April, pardon me, um, and then we'll be presented to council, proceeding to external referrals, public hearing and plan adoption, hopefully um, by June of this year. Um, that is our last slide. Uh, thank you again for, for your time and, and the discussion. I really appreciate that. And I, I think there's a lot of great stuff for us to consider there. And um, I know uh, I know you all volunteer your time here. So, so thank you very much, uh, Lauren, Angela, Graham, and Gary. Really appreciate it. Okay, thanks, Owen. I appreciate it. If you could lower your screen there, I think sure. we are able to move on unless there's any final comments for Owen. Does anyone have anything, Graham? Uh, I just, I, I, oh, am I off mute? Yes, I am. Um, I just wanted to comment on one more thing. We covered so much, but this is really diving a little deeper into the guidelines. I just noted something as a landscape architect that mm -hmm. I've, I've seen be problematic in the CVRD it's challenging in the other areas is um, on page 71 under protected areas. When you're asking a QEP to do a plant, a planting restoration plan, we've, I know that I brought this up when I worked at the CVRD is um, QEPs. Um, what happens is QEPs do not, their expertise is not developing landscape plans for construction. That's a landscape architect's expertise. And so what happens is, there's a, a discrepancy in quality of construction documents. So when you're talking about a landscape plan for development and, and you get a construction grade document that has elevations, all that sort of stuff that you need for proper construction, when you ask uh, uh, QEP to provide a landscape plan, you're not getting, it's not the same thing. And so what I've always said is, and, and that's not actually the, the written within the RAR is that um, a QEP does a plan. They can recommend a plan, but it's it's not that it's not written that they do the plan. So I think it's better. You get better quality work that is ready for construction if you insert a landscape architect to to be doing the actual landscape plans for restoration. That's something that I noted on at number eight. I think it's very beneficial for any community to do that because the the gaps in quality of of construction level documents. Um, is it's night and day and it's it, it can be frustrating for people who uh, are looking for uh, professional construction services uh, to deal with a say an agrologist or somebody who had, did a napkin sketch or a list of plant species that's not suffice and that's what we were seeing before and so I think it just marries well with what you guys have done as far as into as making sure that a landscape architect is involved in, in developing those construction level documents. And this is one spot where you need to re-inject re them, definitely, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Great, thanks, Karen. Yeah. Just to clarify, uh, just for, for staff. So what you're saying, Graham, is essentially the, the QEP would 
determine the level of mitigation that's required if there is some, and then a landscape architect would take that information and develop the plan? Yeah, ultimately okay. in the RAR, it says that the, the QEB can provide recommendations um, for areas of restoration, and that's the end of it. Um, the next step to do the actual restoration, a lot of the times they double down with the QEP and just say, oh, can you do a plan and QEPs do it? But then what we were seeing is the quality was just, it was, an, it was a list and there was no details, no soil specifications, no standards of planting, none of that reference to BCLNA, nothing. So it's not the, you don't want that because then it opens the door for subjectivity and it, it, it doesn't marry with what you're trying to create in your landscape standards. Yeah, that's a great point. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, seeing no other hands up, I think we'll move on to number six, adjournment on the agenda. So I will, the motion is that the February 24th, 2022 advisory design panel meeting be adjourned at 1148 p.m. Can I get a mover and a seconder? Graham and Angela, thank you. Carried. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you again maybe next month. From the city of Duncan, thank you all very much. Nobody's allowed to quit. <laughs> Thank you. There's no quitting, Graham. Okay, I, I'll try my best.